Please be seated. What a fine looking bunch of patriots. I'm so pleased to be invited here to our 16th state to talk with you fine citizens. I, I consider myself to be a son of the American Revolution, although I wasn't an active uh, fighter in that war. But thank you so much for the invitation, Mr. Feith. Are you well, Mr. President? How are things going? Well, actually, I am well. And uh, I'm surprised to be doing so well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I, I've, I've never been a healthy person. All, all my life, I've been troubled with bilious fevers that would sometimes incapacitate me for days or, or even weeks at a time. And it was for that reason that I was unable to accept a lot of important and interesting posts for my country. I, I just didn't think my health would, would, would tolerate it. But now, I, I never expected to live a long time, but, but here I am, and I've outlived so many of my contemporaries that sometimes I, <laughs> I wonder if I've outlived myself. But I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I'm delighted to be back at Montpelier after so long an absence uh, with my dear Dolly. Montpelier is a, is a wonderful place. Have any of you visited Montpelier? Oh, I'm so glad to see that. Those that have not, please come and visit. Uh, there's been a lot of reconstruction. The, the house looks, looks wonderful. It was built by my father in about Oh, 1760. I can remember as a child, <laughs> I can remember as a child of nine or ten helping to carry some furniture into the house. We didn't call it Montpelier back then, of course. Uh, it was only much later that we did. And then when my father passed away, since I was the eldest of 12 children, I inherited the, uh, the house and, and the grounds. Then in uh, about 1800, uh, I did some major reconstruction, and my neighbor and friend, Thomas Jefferson, as you know, is, a, is an amateur architect, and he gave me some uh, good points on how I might improve the appearance and function of the house. Uh, we have a, a lot of visitors there. Marquis de Lafayette was there just a few years ago to, to visit us, and some people come just to see, <laughs> to see what the old man looks like, see if he can still walk and talk. But I'm so pleased to be back home after the hurly-burly of Washington and Philadelphia and, and New York and to be back with my beloved Dolly. Well, I was going to ask you about Mrs. Madison. Is she well? Is, is she at Montpelier? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mr. Feith, uh, I'm so blessed. A happy marriage is one of the greatest gifts that God can give a man. And my Dolly has been a wonderful thing for me. She has really, truly made my life complete. I've, I've always been a, a rather shy person. Some, some people think I'm cold, but I'm really just rather shy in large groups. But Dolly is so warm and so friendly that even my enemies love her. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, whom we call CC, after he lost the election of 1808, said, I lost the election to Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a chance if I'd run against Mr. Madison alone. <laughs> Dolly was a Quaker, you know. Her, uh, her father, uh, John Payne, converted to the Society of Friends. And uh, when he did so, he uh, freed his slaves. A great, great financial sacrifice. So the, 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 the family moved to Philadelphia and it was there that Dolly met and married a young Quaker lawyer named uh, John Todd. And they had two fine young boys, Temple Todd and Payne Todd. And then the yellow fever epidemic struck. Do you, you remember when the epidemic struck Philadelphia in 93? Within days, Dolly lost her husband, both her husband's parents, and one of her children. It was, it was a, a, a terrible tragedy. So she went and helped her mother, who was uh, running a boarding house in Philadelphia. And um, Colonel Aaron Burr was a resident of that boarding house. And it was Colonel Burr, actually at that time he was Senator Burr, 
introduced me to Dolly. He, he was quite a good friend of, of the family. And she was only 26 and I was 43. But I immediately fell in love with this beautiful young woman in her drab Quaker garb. And I proposed and she accepted and we were married less than a year after her former husband had died. Uh, as you recall, uh, my predecessor in the executive mansion was Thomas Jefferson, who was a widower. And uh, his daughter, uh, Martha Jefferson Randolph, helped out with uh, being hostess for a while. But since I was his secretary of state and friend, Mr. Jefferson asked Dolly if she would help by being a hostess in the White House. And so she agreed to do so. And so she was hostess for the eight years of Mr. Jefferson's presidency, and then the eight years of my presidency. So she was the primary hostess of Washington for 16 years. It's no wonder that later she was called the first lady, uh, the first first lady. Uh, Dolly was a, a beautiful, beautiful woman. She had a gorgeous figure, and she liked to wear low-cut dresses to kind of show it off a bit. Now, now, nothing, nothing scandalous, you understand. I mean, nothing too revealing. I mean, it, it wouldn't do for the president's wife to be calling a, causing a scandal. Did you ever know um, Betsy Bonaparte? Yeah. Well, Betsy was, uh, was born in Baltimore, but she married Jerome Bonaparte, who was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's brother. And um, she wore these dresses that were so transparent that there were <laughs> tongues were wagging all over Washington. But I noticed that even those that criticized her so severely almost broke their necks trying to get a, a, a better view. <laughs> now, Dolly, Dolly was the perfect, perfect spouse for me, both, both in the time when we were involved in politics and now in a more peaceful existence back at Montpelier. Some people have, um, have called you the father of the Constitution. Would you, would you comment upon that, about the writing of the Constitution? Well, uh, you're, you're too kind. Uh, there, there were many hearts, many hands that contributed to the writing of the Constitution. Remember that our charge was not to write a Constitution, but to revise the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation were very weak. There was no, no executive, there was no ability to tax. So there, it was a very weak contract between the states. So we realized that the Articles didn't need a revision, they needed replacement. So I did as I always do in those circumstances. I went to the, my books and I studied all the uh, ancient and modern uh, republics to see what ideas worked and what ideas didn't work, but I was totally unprepared for the chicaneries and perversions and, and delays of the lawyers and the demi-lawyers in the group. It, it's, just, it's, it's amazing that we, just, we did as well as we did. And there were two reasons for that, and the primary reason was General Washington. First of all, many people didn't want to come to the Constitutional Convention. They, they thought it was an exercise in futility. But when General Washington came at the head of the Virginia delegation, they all sent their best men. All the states sent their best men. So by General Washington agreeing to come and to chair this convention, uh, it made a difference in who came. Second, because everybody assumed that General Washington would be the first president, they were willing to give more power to the first president than they ever would have had they not known who that president would be. So General Washington was, was one of the primary things that enabled us to succeed as well as we did. The second thing, of course, was secrecy. We made a pledge to one another that everything that went on was going to be a secret because we wanted people to be frank in their opinions and not be grandstanding for the folks back home. In spite of those advantages, we had some real problems. Of course, the biggest problem was big states and small states. The, the small states, of course, naturally, wanted it to be equal. They wanted equal representation for every state. But the big states, naturally, wanted it according to the population. So we made a, after a while, we hammered out a compromise. 
so that the lower house, the House of Representatives, would be proportional, and the uh, upper house, the Senate, would be equal among the states. Not everybody liked that, but they were willing to accept it. A second major problem, of course, was slavery. And uh, many people, of course, would have liked to have had slavery outlawed in the Constitution. But we knew that if we did that, the southern states would never ratify. And so we had to work out a compromise. And so in the Constitution, slavery is never mentioned. It just says that representation shall be based on the number of free persons and three-fifths of all other persons. Uh, other persons are slaves, of course. Now, now, of course, the North hated this because it gave the Southern planters more representation according to the number of slaves we had. They had. But, <laughs> although I had some too. <laughs> but they had to swallow this bitter pill, and so the Constitution was accepted by the members of the convention. That, that seems like a lot of work and a lot of contention. I mean, were you relieved when it was finally approved? Oh yeah, oh yes, of course, of course. I was very relieved when the uh, Constitutional Convention agreed on a document. But nobody was satisfied with it. I mean, I wasn't satisfied with it. Nobody was satisfied with it. Uh, there were a, a lot of people, patriotic Americans, who said, you've given the central government too much power. The states are too weak. The central government is too strong. We can't accept that. Patrick Henry was one that objected strenuously to this. The other thing was that many citizens said, you need a Bill of Rights. You need to enumerate the rights of citizens. Well, my position was that if you enumerate some rights, I mean, we couldn't enumerate all the rights, obviously. If we enumerate some rights and not all rights, people might think that those not enumerated were not guaranteed in the Constitution. But after a while, I saw the wisdom of those who really wanted a Bill of Rights. And so when the Constitution was finally ratified and it went into uh, force, while I was in the Congress, I helped to push through a, a Bill of Rights. The ratification was difficult. Now, uh, Alexander Hamilton and I and John Jay wrote a series of papers we called the Federalist Papers, trying to explain to people why we wanted these things, why we did what we did, why we recommended what we recommended. And uh, I think that was helpful in getting the Constitution ratified. I was very relieved when New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify, and I knew that we had a union. However, Virginia had not ratified yet, and if Virginia didn't ratify, of course, George Washington could not be the president. New York had not ratified, one of our largest states. North Carolina had not ratified, so several states had not ratified at that time. They finally did come around. Uh, Virginia was next, and that guaranteed that, that Washington would be president. Um, <laughs> Rhode Island didn't ratify for three years, and then they only did it by a vote of 34 to 32 in their legislature, so that was a close thing. They uh, almost, you know, Rhode Island didn't even come to the Constitutional Convention, and then they were the last state to, to ratify. So yes, finally I, I, was, I was greatly relieved when the, all the states did ratify. And this Constitution, although it's imperfect, has served us well for 40 years. And, and I have hopes that it'll serve us well for many years to come. Mr. President, I, I, I noticed you flagged there before you, I, I was real curious, could you tell us about your flag? Of course. This was the flag during my presidency. Does anybody notice anything particular about the flag? <laughs> Big part? 15 stars. The original Betsy Ross flag, of course, had 13 stars and 13 stripes for the 13 states. And this has 15 stars and 15 stripes. We had added Vermont and Kentucky since that time. So we had 15 states. So the flag then uh, in 95 had 
15 stars and 15 stripes. This was the flag that was called the Star Spangled Banner. This was the flag that was flying over Fort McHenry during the War of 1812. And of course, nobody could really tell who had won or who was winning there. And there was a young lawyer named Francis Scott Key who was on a boat in the middle of Baltimore Harbor. And he, he wondered, can, can you still see the flag? If, if you can see the flag, then we've, we've, we've held the fort. And occasionally, um, by a rocket's red glare or a bomb bursting in air, you could see that the flag was there. But finally, when the dawn came, the flag was there. He penned this poem called The Star Spangled Banner, and it was put to an old English drinking song and became the de facto uh, anthem uh, of, our, of our country. Then, of course, a few years later, we, we added five more states. In, in 1818, during Mr. Monroe's administration, we'd added Tennessee and Ohio and Louisiana and Indiana and Mississippi. So they, they decided, they debated whether to have a 20-stripe flag. 13 stripes, 13 states. 15 stripes, 15 states. 20. So they rightly, I think, decided that 20 stripes was too many stripes. So they went back to the 13 stripes and had 20 stars. And of course today we have 24 states, but it's still just 24 stars and 13 stripes. Mr. President, um, many people claim that the United States is a Christian country. And they say that you and Mr. Jefferson uh, conspired to eliminate religion from American life. Um, how do you respond to those sorts of accusations? I say those people who accuse me and Mr. Jefferson of being anti-religious haven't read what I've written, haven't listened to what I have to say, or have deliberately distorted my opinions. Now, I'm for the separation of church and state, but I firmly believe that it strengthens religion. It, it doesn't weaken it. Remember that when we became an, uh, independent, all the states, except I think Rhode Island and um, Maryland, had state religions. In the north it was primarily congregational, in the south it was primarily Anglican. But the people that didn't adhere to those state religions often had certain civil disabilities. They might not be able to vote. They might not be able to hold office. I myself have seen Baptists jailed for preaching the gospel in the state of Virginia. And I think that state religion is not only deleterious to the states that are excluded, it's also deleterious to the states that are included. It's deleterious to the state religion. When you have clergymen that are paid by the state instead of by the parishioners, they become lazy and dissolute. And I think that's what's happened to the College of William and Mary. The Anglican clergy there uh, stifled uh, inquiry. Uh, now, I know Mr. Jefferson went there and he was happy, but he was under the influence of, of Mr. William Small, who was the only faculty member at William and Mary who was not a clergyman. That's one of the reasons I decided to go to the University of uh, New Jersey, in Princeton, New Jersey. Now, it was founded as a Presbyterian school, but it was not a narrow Presbyterian school. It allowed for a wide open discussion of these things and a tolerance of other religions. And it taught me how we could uh, open up to, uh, to all religions in our country. It, it made a profound influence on me. No, I, Mr. Jefferson and I are not opposed to religion. We believe that religion will be strengthened if men are free to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. Well, Mr. President, you state that, yet um, you talk about men being great and equal and entitled to life, liberty, and, and happiness, but you hold slaves. Um, yes. I've... <clears throat> I've struggled with that all my life. And, and now in, in old age, I, I don't, I'm no closer to an answer than I was when I was, when I was younger. How I wish 
that in 1621, when that first Dutch boatload of slaves came to our shores, how I wish that we'd said, if these men set foot on our soil, they are free men. But we didn't. And so now, 200 years later, slavery is so much a part of the fabric of our nation that I don't know how to, how to extirpate it. Um, I thought for a while that the answer would be to send the blacks back to Africa. And we tried that, actually. Uh, we were able to repatriate about a thousand a year. <laughs> but the African-American population was increasing at 60,000 a year. So obviously that was not the, not the answer to it. Um, some people have said, well, well, why don't you just free your slaves? I don't know what they would do. See, they, they can't stay in the, unit, in the state of Virginia as free blacks. So they would have to leave the only home and the only work they've ever known. I don't think they could survive. We, we, we have a symbiotic relationship. I need them, and they need me. I, it, it's as if we have a wolf by the ears. We can't let go, but we can't hold on forever. I, I greatly fear that slavery uh, is the greatest danger to our republic. And I'm sorry I have no solution. Um, in your political career, what do you think were your greatest mistakes? <laughs> well, uh, I've made a lot of them, but um, I suppose one of the mistakes I regret greatly is my alienation of General Washington. Uh, General Washington and I uh, really worked very closely together when he was the first president and I was in the, in the first Congress. In fact, uh, General Washington asked me to write his inaugural address which I did, and uh, he presented it, and it was uh, uh, well received. And then as a member of Congress, uh, Congress asked me to uh, write a response to General Washington's address, and so I, I did, and um, it, was, it was quite well received. And then General Washington said, would you please respond to Congress? And so I wrote a response to the Congressional response and uh, it was uh, well received. So the point is that General Washington and I were very close for a long time. And we were close until Jay's Treaty of 1786, to, the trying to, no, I'm sorry, 1794, trying to avoid war with Great Britain. Uh, it didn't avoid the war, of course, it just delayed it a little bit. But I was greatly opposed to this treaty, as were many people were greatly opposed to Jay's treaty. And well, I knew that according to Article, um, uh, I'm sorry, Article 3 of the, no, let's see. Article 2 of the Constitution, the, uh, the president, the executive, according, uh, with the advice and consent of the Senate, was able to make treaties with foreign countries. And that according to Article 6 of the Constitution, these treaties had the same force as the Constitution itself. But I thought, aha, Article 1, Section 7, says that all money bills have to start in the House. And I said, I can kill this bill by withholding funds for it. Well, it, it didn't work. Uh, first of all, the bill passed, the treaty was ex uh, accepted, and I lost the confidence of General Washington forever. So that, that, was a, that was a mistake. Second mistake that I can recall was accepting the Republican notion that standing armies were dangerous. Uh, so instead of having uh, a trained army, <coughs> and a Navy, when War of 1812 finally became inevitable, uh, we were totally unprepared for that war. We had uh, little, little coastal gunboats uh, against the, the Royal Navy, which was the most powerful in the world. And we had a few untrained militiamen 
against the trained troops of, uh, of Great Britain. I mean, it was okay in peacetime. It was, we saved a lot of money, but, but when, we, when it came to wartime, we were terribly, terribly unprepared. Fortunately, we had such courageous Americans like Oliver Hazard Perry on the Great Lakes that stopped the British from being able to move their men and material back and forth on the water. And uh, then, of course, there was General Jackson who trounced the British at, at New Orleans. Now, of course, that happened after the war was officially over, but it didn't really matter because during this war, it wasn't territory gained or other advantages like that. It was psychological. Before the war, we were kind of Britain's stepchild and we had to kind of toe the line for them. And after the war, they thought of us as more equal. The world thought of us as a world power, but even more than that, we thought of ourselves as a country, uh, unified and strong, that could stand up to the greatest powers in the world. So it made, it made a tremendous difference, uh, even though we didn't gain any territory or anything like that. Um, well, following that up, Mr. President, uh, what things are you most proud of in your political career? I think the thing I'm most proud of is my uh, protection of religious liberty. Now, in, in 1785, Patrick Henry tried to pass a bill uh, providing for state support of churches in the state of Virginia. Now, do you know Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry is a spellbinding orator. He is so powerful in his speech that he can convince anyone of anything, and I'm not. So I did what I always do. I went back to my books, went to the library, and I wrote a discourse, a remonstrance and a memorial against religious assessments. And uh, people read it and understood it and agreed, and in the end, my scholarship trumped Mr. Henry's oratory, and his bill was defeated, and the bill for religious freedom in Virginia was passed instead. I'm very proud of, of protecting religious freedom. Also, I'm proud of the fact that in the War of 1812, I was able to uh, prevail without constraining the liberties of Americans. You know, when, when John Adams felt constrained, when he felt put upon, he passed the Alien Sedition Acts. And, uh, would not allow people to criticize the judgment, the, the, the government. It, it would be funny if it weren't so sad when, once Mr. Adams was going through Newark, New Jersey, and they were firing a cannon to celebrate. And, and somebody said, there's the president and they're firing at his ass. And there was a fellow named Luther Baldwin says, I don't care if they fire through his ass. And so Mr. Baldwin was put in the jail. He was jailed for defaming the president. So I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I was able to carry us through that war without constraining the liberties of Americans. Uh, you know, we, have a, we have a pretty good crowd here today, Mr. President. Would you be willing to take some questions from the Of course, of course, be glad to. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why didn't you repeal the Alien Sedition Act? Well, they, first of all, I didn't become president until eight years after they expired. Uh, I was, the, the Alien Sedition Acts died a, a, a quiet death uh, at the end of John Adams' term. Uh, it's too bad they couldn't have been repealed earlier. In fact, I helped shepherd through the state of Virginia uh, an act that decried these. And Mr. Jefferson did the same thing in Kentucky. Some people like, well, John Calhoun misunderstood what we said. Mr. Calhoun said we wanted nullification. He was trying to justify his nullification. But Mr. Jefferson and I were not talking about nullification. We just said that they ought to be overturned by the Supreme Court or throw the damn Federalists out of power and, and get rid of it that way. But it expired. It died a natural death at the end of Adam's term, so we didn't have to, have to do anything. 
Yes, sir. How much trouble was it to get uh, the money to buy Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase? Well, of course, I was Secretary of State during, during the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, there was some problem there because the Constitution had no real uh, way to do that. It had to be stretched a lot. So Mr. Jefferson argued that because the, the, uh, the West Bank of the Mississippi was included in this, and the Mississippi was our primary avenue of commerce, that, that promoting interstate commerce, so he said that the purchase came in the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which was stretching the Constitution until it cracked a little bit. But still, I don't think even today anybody would disagree. I mean, Napoleon is a very mercurial person, and he offered it to us, and we were afraid that if we didn't take it right away that he might take it back. So I think that Mr. Jefferson did absolutely the right thing, even though it wasn't clearly permitted by the Constitution. He, he stretched the Constitution a little bit. But no, once it was decided to do it, to getting the, the $15 million was, was not hard. Yes, sir? Did you ever envision the Commerce Clause being expanded to the point it is now? No, sir. I had no idea. Uh, Mr. Jefferson did it while I was Secretary of State, and I was a, a, a part of that. So, I, but I didn't realize that the Commerce Clause was going to be used. I guess maybe we set that precedent by arguing that that we needed both both banks of the Mississippi uh, in order to get the commerce from the from the north down and out through New Orleans. Uh, so we were probably complicit in that expansion of the powers of the Constitution. No, I had no idea it would go as far as it has. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. President, how about discussion of women's rights? Has anybody uh, spoken up for women? Well, both, both Abigail Adams uh, and Dolly were, were very powerful women who had a, a lot of influence. They didn't have the vote. Uh, but of course, v women had the vote nowhere in the world at that time. Uh, but Dolly, for instance, uh, when we moved the country, the government, from Philadelphia, which was a very cosmopolitan city, to Washington, which was a swamp that had, uh, well, <laughs> Governor Morris, famously said, all we need here is a few uh, scholarly men, amiable women, kitchens, cellars, houses to make it an ideal city. So it was really a mud hole and there were only a few boarding houses. And generally, the Republicans stayed at their boarding houses and the Federalists stayed at their boarding houses and they didn't get together at all the way they did in Philadelphia where there were theaters and restaurants and so on. So Dolly, when I was Secretary of State, opened up our house on F Street to lots and lots of parties. They weren't just celebration among friends. They were to enable these Federalists and Republicans to have a chance to get together in social circumstances and get to know one another and to realize that they didn't have horns. It was, you can't imagine the strife between the parties. I mean, Republicans did not trust the Federalists. The Federalists did not trust the um, Republicans. It was awful. I hope that that never happens again in our country. <laughs> But we did have these powerful women who, although they did not have the vote, had much influence on what went on. Yes, ma'am. The moving it from Philadelphia to D.C., were you involved in that? No, not really. Okay. Uh, what, why did it happen? Well, uh, the, 
it was a, uh, a, a kind of a compromise. Actually, I was involved in a little bit between Alexander Hamilton and, and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. The, the, the Southerners, of course, wanted the capital to be down near the South. And uh, Hamilton and the New Yorkers did not. But Hamilton was trying to get us to assume the debt of the states. And so there was some horse trading that went on there. So Hamilton never said that he would vote f or be in favor of the capital being moved to Washington, but he said he wouldn't object to it. He would, he would, he would stay out of the fray. And Jefferson and I said that, okay, we, we will not we do not, we're not in favor of assuming the debt of the states, but we won't vote against it. We won't work against it. If, you, we'll, if you'll scratch my back, we'll scratch your back. And so that was kind of a compromise about where to put the capital and uh, what to do about the debt of the states. Was Washington, uh, D.C. originally a part of Virginia or Maryland or? Uh, a little was taken out of both. Okay. A little was taken out of both. Most of it was taken out of Virginia. But, but yes, it was, it was taken out of Maryland too. They felt that it was better not to have it in any state. Mm -hmm. It would be better to have a, a federal republic. I mean, the possible possibility that the war, so-called war of 1812, could have been prevented. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I did everything I could to avoid that war. I tried extensive legal briefs. I tried diplomacy. We tried economic pressure. We tried to boycott English goods. We tried to stop commerce with England. Uh, it hurt our New England merchants more than it hurt England. England interfered with our commerce on the high seas. And she even would stop our boats and take sailors off. Now, now of course, George III had a totally different idea of citizenship than we did. His idea was that these are his subjects, and they're his subjects until he says that they can go. Whereas we said, you know, if you want to be an American, come, come, you can be an American. But George III said, no, these are my subjects. And so I'm going to, even though they have come and they call themselves American, I'm going to stop their boats, I'm going to take them off, put them back in the Royal Navy, and put them, put them to, as fighting sailors in the Royal Navy. Well, that was intolerable. We couldn't put up with that. It was not only the idea of interfering with commerce and taking our people, but it was the humiliation of having Britain trying to put us in our place, to treat us as, as stepchildren. It, we, had, we were forced into fighting a second war of independence. No, I, I, I did everything I could to avoid it, and I don't think it could have been avoided. Maybe it could have been avoided by lying back supine and saying, okay, whatever you want, but, but to be a sovereign country, no, I don't think we could have avoided it. So, so Mr. President, you're saying Great Britain never really, they always looked at us as, um, I guess, they never looked at us as a separate nation? No, they never looked at us as a sovereign nation. And because they did not, much of the world did not. And often we did not, you know? General Jackson, by smashing the English forces at New Orleans, changed, as I say, it didn't change the, the map, but it changed the mind. The people had a, they looked at us differently. They looked at us as a strong, sovereign nation. Yes, ma'am? Well, how did you and Paul Hickory get along? Uh, we got along okay. Uh, it was I that appoint. He was a militia uh, general, and it was I that gave him gave him his appointment as a major general in the United States Army. Uh, I was a little concerned because he was a, a loose cannon. You know, I, I, I wasn't sure I could control uh, General Jackson, and, and of course, as you know, that's that's a primary tenet of the United States of America. 
that the civilians have control over the military, unlike many other countries where the military has control. But it's a primary tenet of the United States of America that the civilians have control over the military. And I was a little concerned about that. But it never came to pass that I had a contretemps with, with General Jackson. We, we, we had the same goals in mind. Yes, sir? Speaking of General Jackson, what, uh, what is your opinion of the election of 1824? The what? Election of 1824. Oh. Well, in the election of 1824, as, as, as you recall, we had four candidates in there. We had uh, Jackson and Adams and Clay and Crawford. And Jackson got a major plurality of the vote, but he didn't get a majority of the vote. So the vote went to the House, and Henry Clay was out because he was fourth vote getter. Crawford, although he'd had, a, he'd had a stroke and could hardly speak and couldn't walk, was still got the third largest number of votes <laughs> in, in that election. So Henry Clay was out of the election, but Clay was very influential in the Congress. And so when the, when the vote went to the House, Clay was able to swing the vote to Adams. And uh, that was a, a real mistake because the country was up in arms about that. They called that the corrupt bargain. And Adams was never comfortable in his presidency because so many people were against him and they all were in favor of the hero, General Jackson. So the next election in 28, Jackson trounced him. Uh, and most people said Jackson finally took his rightful place. Uh, some of the, this, this election was one of the most controversial that I know of. The 1800 was a very controversial election too. But we changed the Constitution. We amended the Constitution after the 1800 election to, you, you remember it was uh, when you, in the Electoral College, the one that got the most votes was the president, and the one that got the second largest number of votes was the vice president. Well, that didn't work very well, because the vice president and the president were of different parties, or factions, as the General Washington called them. So, but we changed that. We, with the 14th Amendment, we were able to correct that mistake that I and my fellows made when we originally wrote the Constitution. The Constitution is a living document. I mean, it, it can't be done once and forever. It's, it has to be amended from time to time in order to keep up with the, uh, the changing society. In fact, I have a, a, a quote here. This is, this is a quote of my friend and, and mentor, Thomas Jefferson, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and manners and opinions change with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. We might as well require a man to still wear the coat which fitted him when a boy as civilized society to remain ever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. And I think we'll have to agree with Mr. Jefferson on that. Yes, sir? Can you tell me about your, your policy toward Native Americans, toward the Indians? Well, unfortunately, the Native Americans in my time were the enemy. And, uh, many of our citizens were killed by, by the Native Americans. And I can recognize that there was two sides to the argument. We were, after all, taking their territory. But, but during my presidency, I looked upon them as the enemy. Mr. President, you talked a lot about Thomas Jefferson. You're a friend, a, a collaborator with him. 
Could you give us some insight on Mr. Jefferson when he was alive? When he was Thomas Jefferson was my friend and my mentor for 50 years. I, uh, I admired him and I loved him. He was, um, he was genius. He was a true Renaissance man. James Parton once said that Jefferson could uh, try a cause, uh, plan an estate, uh, tie an artery, break a horse, dance a minuet, and play the violin. And, and he could. He, he could do all those things. He and John Adams, who were friends and then enemies and then friends again, died three years ago on the 4th of July, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration. But we have to remember that he was not a god, he was a man, and he had many of the failings that, that, that all of us have. Uh, how, how can I put this delicately? Um, Mr. Jefferson always believed that he told the greater truth, although some of the details might be a little inaccurate. For instance, when he denied that he'd slandered General Washington in that letter to Philip Matsai, uh, he, he clearly wrote the letter. What he probably meant was that it was distorted in the translation or, or something of that sort. And um, when he denied that Calendar, James Calendar, you know, the, the muckraking uh, author, uh, pamphleteer, uh, when he denied that he'd hired Calendar to, to smear John Adams, uh, it came back to bite him when Calendar showed the receipts and all for, for, for money. So, um, then to Mr. Jefferson sometimes, being a dreamer, uh, had some funny ideas. That is, he believed that laws should expire at the end of a generation. He thought after 19 years, all laws should be repealed and then, then new laws reenacted. And, and I reminded him that, that we had uh, t taken so much from our ancestors and we hoped to give so much to our descendants that that really wasn't very practical. Also, Mr. Jefferson sometimes had trouble um, carrying a task through to its conclusion. That is, when, when he was governor of Virginia, when the British invaded and his term of office was up, and um, he left. He left and went home and left the state of Virginia with no chief executive for about 10 days until Thomas Nelson was, was appointed there. So, um, when he was General Washington's Secretary of State, he left early before his term was up, although General Washington begged him to stay. And when he was president, I was his Secretary of State, and for the last four months of his administration, he did practically nothing. Uh, I, I was acutely embarrassed because I, I couldn't, I didn't have the authority to do those things that were left undone. Um, so he had his flaws. He had his definite flaws, but he was a patriotic American. He was a marvelous writer. He was a, a protector of the common man and a great American. Mr. President, I know your schedule is very full and I appreciate you being here today. I just in closing, um, do you miss being out of uh, the center of things in your retirement? Do you miss being away? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I am so happy to be out of New York, Philadelphia, and Washington and back home at peace at Montpelier. I can't tell you how happy I am. Well, thank you all so much for inviting me. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America. Amen.